here in the auditorium. Obviously, those watching the streaming, we always start promptly on time. But the last few weeks, you may notice we have started a few minutes late because of what we're doing here in the auditorium that first 10 minutes or so. But we welcome you at this hour. And uh, we have prayer, and then the choir will be singing. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. And uh, thank you for this day. Your blessings upon us this day. Thank you for the folks who put forth the effort to be here tonight. May your blessings be up on this service. May, you, may your name be lifted up and exalted. And uh, Lord, I trust you'd be pleased with all that's said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
songs where there's certain phrases. I hope there's certain phrases that you begin to meditate on and think on that really speak to you. I love that statement, that last line. Think of your salvation tonight. Life now is sweet, and my joy is complete. So many people have not found that complete joy because they haven't been saved. Their life, they're trying to find that sweet life, that good life, and everything else, but they have not found that sweet life in Jesus Christ. And then it follows up with, I'm saved, saved. Those notes are high, so you've got to open up and just sing it out to the Lord. I hope you get that last slide tonight. You rejoice in the fact that your life is now sweet. And your joy is complete. Why? Because I'm saved, saved, saved. Verse number three. When poor and celebration for the wife than the husband, but nevertheless, it's husband and wife. May I say, I, I appreciate all the accolades and kindness and all that goes on, but the truth of the matter is, it's all of our anniversary. I mean, it, it's not just me, it's, it's you know, like a husband and wife. It's you and me, all of us working as partners together, right? And that's been a great journey, and I praise God for the opportunity to be the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And uh, others before me, other pastors before me, established quite a legacy for this church. And uh, try to keep that legacy up it is sometimes a challenge. But uh, our church has been known around the country for uh, young people going into the ministry and a lot of things. And I'm glad, truly, I'm glad to be the pastor. I thank you for all of your kindness to Debbie and me and all of our family uh, through time. Well, this week, all the regular activities going on, nothing out of the usual. Next Sunday night will be a youth activity after church Sunday night, right? And we've really not done that ever before, I don't believe. But there won't be an activity this week for the teenagers. Wednesday night, of course, Masters Clubs and the church at 7 o'clock. We'll look forward to that. But otherwise, enjoy kind of a slower week, I guess, than typically what we have. And that'll be nice for everyone. Tomorrow, President's Day. And uh, how many have to work tomorrow? You have to work tomorrow. All right. A few of you have to work tomorrow. How many do not have to work tomorrow? Terry, you don't ever work, do you? No. No, that's what I thought. Tim and Tim. And every day is the same to you guys, right? Yeah, retired, every day is the same. And so they don't care if it's President's Day. Eric, you don't care what it is. Just another day, right? Uh, retired folks. But uh, anyway, here at school, of course, it's closed down. Offices will be closed down, and everyone gets a little bit of a break here right in the middle of the winter. Maybe we're a little past the middle. I like to think we're a little past the winter. Actually, driving to church tonight, a couple things. Boy, isn't it nice to come to church in the daylight? I like that. And, you know, that wasn't true back in December and January. They didn't to drive to church in the daylight on Sunday nights. The other thing I took notice tonight, though, that really meant something to me, you know, our river... My, my, it's been frozen tight for more than a month, right? I mean, it's been solid ice out there, and it broke loose this past week, and that was good because, my, oh, my, how many of you figure? 50? I don't know, maybe more than that. Uh, seagulls were all over the river, and so that's a good sign as well. To see those seagulls moving toward the north, that's always a good thing. We saw robins a couple weeks ago. 
uh, out there on our property. And I know some other folks have said they've seen robins. So I think we're a little past the middle of the winter and going toward the other end. My goodness, March is next week. Can you imagine that? We're right up on March now. But uh, I should just come wait on us for the offering. And uh, this week, hope you'll enjoy this week. Be in your family. Enjoy your family. Debbie's mom used to say to us, Joel, Joel would be squawking, crying, and all of that business. You know how they do. And uh, Debbie's mom would say, just enjoy these days. They'll be over before you know it. How many know it's over before you know it? You adults here. Yeah. All of a sudden, say, wow. Yeah. Sometimes it's a relief, but most times not, right? <laughs> Oh, I miss my kids all day around me, but I'm glad they're in the Lord's work. I think of it during church, and we're singing and doing things. And even, you know, the Bible says pray without ceasing, and so I do. And so I say, hey, sit there, we're doing whatever we're doing. Joel, I hope Joel tonight, right now, probably getting ready to preach. Be Jonathan, not Joy, he's getting ready to preach. Nathan Stewart over there, Tommy Dallas, they're all getting ready to preach. And so I think of that all through church. I'm very thankful for my children. I wish they could be with me, but I'm glad they're preaching God's word somewhere. And that's a great blessing. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the years of allowing me to be the pastor of this wonderful church with all the people. We pray that you bless now tonight and in the finances. And Lord, help us just rejoice in the opportunity to give our tithes and offerings. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> church tonight. Looking forward to that. We do have this card we've been talking about today. It's on that little table back there. We can grab one tonight. We have 500 of these. And a month from today starts up our prophecy conference with Norris Belcher. The front says, are these the last days? And the dates are on there. His picture on the back and all the information. So hope we plan on start giving these out, praying for this conference, invite people out to this great conference. Looking forward to a time. Lord, speak in our hearts. Turn to 86, please. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's all stand here, please. My Jesus, I love thee.
meditate on this thought. I want to sing this together to church and uh, just sing it beautifully. Jump in a part. Let's be one big choir. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I ever adore Thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing. Thank you. 
came out, and uh, I forget the title of it right now. Debbie, what was the title of it? Night Song. You know, how many of you in here have ever seen the Christian movie Night Song? All right, I think we've shown it here at church already. Night Song. And the Night Song, the movie Night Song is one of those movies that just ripped my heart out. And that song, that song, it has a great deal of meaning to me because of the movie. And uh, you'll have to, nowadays you can find movies somewhere on the computer, right? I guess it's still out there. I don't know if it's still out there. It's old. I mean, the kids, it's all, it's about teenagers. Uh, a lot of, te several teenagers, the main story is about some teenagers. They've got bell bottoms on, you know, and they've got an afro, and, you know, so it's, a, it's back there a little ways. But uh, it's a very heart-wrenching movie. And uh, you want to just show it to your family someday. That'd be great. And, uh, good. But that song, they keep singing that song. There's a boy, it's a typical city, but he keeps going out on this little deck. And he keeps singing that little chorus there, that little song. And so uh, it just has a lot of meaning to it. Open your Bibles, please, <clears throat> to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And chapter number 2. I remember long ago when I was young teenager or young adult, for some reason I used to think to myself, boy, the Apostle Paul was a mean man. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of things where he's really strong with the people. The church at Corinth, first and second Corinthians, we would have those books in the Bible. And uh, they of course they were known, they are known as the most carnal church, fleshly church in the Bible. And uh, there were some real issues, including incest, but there were issues in that church going on that he had to address. Sir, quite a number of things going on there that he had to address. And I remember thinking, boy, he is a mean man. He's a mean preacher. By the way, sometimes the preacher comes across that way, right? You know why? Because people have to be corrected. And that never sets well with any of us, right? It's like a child. We never enjoy being corrected about anything. And so that's the way it has to work. The Apostle Paul, there were different areas where I thought, boy, he is a mean man. As I got older, as I was, became pastor in these years now, I begin to see into his heart and what his real passion was and what was going on in his heart. Why he was strong at times, but also the representation on a few occasions where that he was so, so tender-hearted. And tonight, I had a man come into my office on Friday morning, talked to him for about an hour there at 8.15, and uh, I was talking to Debbie about it at lunch, and uh, Anyway, I said to Debbie on this issue, I said, well, I was just transparent with him. Well, that's what it's going to be tonight. And just transparent. And I have written on the title of my paper here tonight, the title of the sermon, The Pastor's Heart. And I think it's important you understand the pastor's heart. I don't know. Maybe there's somebody, maybe there's another occupation out there where the pastor has a heart so involved in his occupation. And there are times when I think to myself, maybe I'd just rather go work at the factory and go home at four o'clock and forget everything. Um, but that's not what God called me to do, so that doesn't work. The pastor's heart, though, is a different kind of a heart. And we see the Apostle Paul here in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, we see his heart. Uh, a few weeks ago, I forget, I think it was on a Wednesday night perhaps, and then we read over in the book of Acts and, and uh, chapter 16 there where that it talks about he gave some instruction to the church. He'd been there a little while with them. He gave some instruction to the church. Some warnings really of how that people would come in um, in sheep clothing. Wolves would come in in sheep clothing, sort of like our governor, you know. 
and uh, and come in with uh, sheep in sheep clothing, and uh, it was really a big bad wolf. You know what I mean. And so he warned them about that, and uh, and then at the very close of the chapter, it says there the very last two or three verses that they all wept and they wept on each other's neck on his neck they are hugging and they wept on each other's neck boy I've been there I've been there with people Kathy I've been there with people not her but somebody that's close to her I've been there with her uh, with that person and I've been there with different people and to feel a person's warm tears trickling down your neck. As a pastor, that is heart-wrenching. Now, you may say, well, why would they be doing all of that? Do you have trials in life? Big trials in life? So there's a lot of people. And they'll come into my office and somebody's wife just walked out on them. Some, some other situation just went on. And they're crushed. They're brokenhearted. And, and, and you know, I would talk a while, but then and sometimes we don't even talk. By the way, oh, Dean Walters, some of you remember Dean Walters, Lisa? Dean Walters used to sing a song when he was back when he was a teenager. Most of you don't know Dean. <coughs> he was a very fine teenage young man that was in our church and, and his sister Gloria and uh, Mary and David Hughes, and they were just wonderful teenagers in our church here. But uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the exact title, Debbie, help me. But what was the song about tears? Uh, it's a language or something along that line. Do you remember, Lisa, what it was? Anyway, it was something along that line uh, that tears are a language. They really are, right? Tears speak a language that the vocabulary of tears, many times, is they are so much more powerful than words. And I've been there with people at deathbed, Situations and all kind of scenes that just rip your heart out. And I will say sometimes as a pastor, you're just thinking, I can't deal with this. It is overwhelming. Not only do you have your own trials to put up with or deal with, but then everybody else's trials. And it is overwhelming a lot of the time. The Apostle Paul, very obviously, he was strong and didn't speak to, we have to get in Corinthians and other places where he was so strong and, and really in people's faces, telling them the way it is. And by the way, don't you want your preacher to always tell the truth? Amen. Amen. What good is it if he just pet you and pepper you and pet you, I'm patting you on the back and you're going out the door, man, I'm pretty good. And we, hopefully this group is pretty good, but we, know, we are never as good as we think we are. And we need to be, all need to be reminded of that sometimes. Amen. And so the preacher has to say the way it is. And by the way, one of the great, great problems in the United States of America is the clergy that will not warn people. That's right. Amen. Now, I don't think it's the most fun part of my job, by the way. I don't think it's, being, it's fun being a confrontational Situation or anything like I don't I hate it that part of it in the flesh I hate it, but it's what love demands out of you. The parent that allows the ch children to run the streets and do whatever they want without any reprimand, any kind of discipline, those people don't really love their child. The one that loves their child is the one that's going to say. Wait, wait a minute, here's the way it is. Here are the rules. You're going to be grounded if you don't, you know. That's the parent that really loves their child. And that's the clergy that loves their people when they will confront the issues and say, here's the way it's going to be. So the Apostle Paul did that. And he addressed issues. But oh, how tenderhearted he was. In 1 Thessalonians, in chapter number 2, let me allow me to read verse 7 and 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children, 
So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Let's just take a few moments, and I'll see if I can utilize my 20 minutes as effectively as Brother James did this morning. He did a great job. He got a lot out there in a short time, did he not? Let's we'll see if we can do that. Notice that there in verse number 8, uses a word affectionately. We're talking about the pastor's heart, and I just want to lay myself out here tonight. And uh, I want you to know what is the stirring issue in the pastor's heart. What is the motivation? I said recently to someone, if this church was the same, now this year you're going to get a million dollar salary. You might say, well, wow, the pastor ever, he would be able to contain himself. He'd just run wild up down the streets and work and let me tell you, a million dollars would not affect me one bit. But the love for Jesus and the love for you is what stirs me. It's not about money at all. I mean, I started, I mentioned this morning, I came back here, dropped out of college, came back here and started working for Emmanuel Baptist. That was 49 years ago. And I became the janitor. I was living at home. I was single. It was all okay. And of course, minimum wage was a lot less, all of that stuff. But I was getting $60 a week. $60. But I thought it was big time money. It was okay. It was fine. Finally, I got married. And Debbie's sister and her brother-in-law came here to church and got us hooked up and uh, all of that. And, and Carol knew from being here in our church what I got for a salary. Oh, Deb, how will you ever be able to live on $60 a week? I mean, you know, you know, minimum wage was a lot less, but still, $60 was pretty bad. How do you ever live on $60 a week? Remember that? So the church gave me $90 a week. They knew she was a big eater. <laughs> and so they upped me to $90 a week. Well, then I was here a little bit of time, and I went back to college, believing God called me to preach, and, and went back to college, and so finally came back. I never, I never intended. The way life has gone is not anything I ever dreamed of. In fact, I went to college to be a full-time evangelist. And in those early years, I preached. I was just saying to Debbie about this. It was pretty phenomenal. Well, James, you've probably heard me tell this. It just still staggers my brain. And we're considering coming up on a revival. And I preached a revival. My very first revival meeting I preached over in Avenel, New Jersey. Brother Charlie, as he would say, he's from Boston. Brother Charlie, like Brother Charlie Clark, you know how they say, Brother Charlie, Brother Charlie Horton. Anyway, he was the pastor. He's been here. He's preached here. And we became such good friends. He was considerably older than I. And, and, and he was willing to allow a 28-year-old kid come in there and preach a revival meeting Sunday through Friday. I was there Sunday through Friday. Get this, a church similar our size, but I was there Sunday through Friday, and 21 people got saved. Yeah. 21 people walked out and got saved. 19 of those were adults. Wow. Think of that. And a detective sat over here on this side. He walks out and gets saved. Over here about where Brother Jeff is. He was someone. <laughs> was a guy that just got out of jail. And he walked out and got saved. Over there, over there, attack them over here. A guy just got out of jail. They both come forward and get saved. Thinking, you know, God is no respecter of persons, is he? Yes. And by his amazing grace and love, miraculous ways, he saves any sinner and all sinner. By the way, the detective or that guy that just got out of jail, they were equal in God's eyes as far as being sinners. And they all needed the blood of Jesus Christ. But my, oh my, 21 people getting saved. I was really excited about that and ended up preaching a lot of revival meetings and was excited. I never dreamed the way that life would evolve. I'd end up being working here. So what I did, though, well, I preached revivals and came back from college. So when I came back from college two years later, now they, I started working here in Emmanuel as assistant and preaching some revivals. Now they bumped me up to $150 a week. I was really moving along. And Joel, now, now I, I realized... 
Now, the reason they did that, they went from 90, they raised me from 60 to 90, so I have food for Debbie, $30 a week. But now I've got Joel. In fact, we're, we're expecting Jonathan. Now two kids, so they bumped me up so I could have money to feed my two kids. And that was enough for my two kids, for sure. And it really was not when Brother James came along in 1982. Amen. And uh, then, boy, oh boy. I'm just saying all that to say. There is not enough money in this world to make me do what I do. Amen. But the call of the Lord God, Jehovah, and my own heart of love for Jesus, and my heart for people. You know, I, by the way, Debbie, I was talking to Debbie this afternoon. I've got some sort of an outline here, but whatever. You know, who cares? It's just us, right? Who cares? I'm just talking as if I'm sitting in my living room, right? But I, I saw a man up at, we were, uh, I think since Christmas maybe, we were up at the turkey ranch up on top of the mountain there for lunch one day. And there was a few people that came out and uh, this man stopped and talked to me. And uh, I knew him, but I knew him well, but I knew him some. And he stopped and talked to me and, and uh, anyway, we chit-chatted, we go on our way. Debbie said, who is that? And uh, I told her that he was a man that over time I got to know in South Williamsport, where the, um, I forget what they call that, but the place where they have bread, you know, that, not, they went out of business or whatever, but that little plaza there was a place where you could go in there and, you know, pick up day old bread, whatever it was, you know. And I'd go there different times. And anyway, just got talking to this man. And he, he, he found out I was a pastor. And, he, uh, it's a long story, but anyway, I, I talked to that man up there at the Turkey Ranch. That place closed down, so I don't get to see him anymore. And I said to her, you know, life is a strange journey, Sue. I do really think of myself as a quiet person. But it's odd because, and she laughs at me, I talk to people all the time. Whether it's about Christ or otherwise, there's always something to say to people, right? There is. There's always something to say to somebody that encourage them about something. I believe the Apostle Paul had such a open heart for people. And he talked to everybody. And there in verse number uh, six, verse number seven, we see how we see this affection, verse seven, verse eight, he uses the word affectionately desirous, but look at verse seven. But we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse, and that's not talking about Ramona, and she delivered all of our kids, helped deliver all of our kids, and a bunch of our grandkids, and she worked there in the maternity ward as a registered nurse, but it's not talking about that kind of a nurse. Throughout the Bible, it refers to a nurse. You remember Moses. Remember Moses' mother, and uh, Pharaoh's uh, daughter found, that, found Moses out there, a little ark out in the water, said, you want me to find a nurse for him? And the sister was there, and, and she went and found her own mother. Now, it wasn't a nurse as an RN, but throughout the Bible, and here it's used as a, as a nurse that cherish, cherisheth her children. He's such, a, he's such a gentle sign, the Apostle Paul, the nursing. We think of a young mother nursing her child. I can see as we would have babies in, and uh, other than Sonia, uh, which was a C-section, but the others, and we'd have these babies delivered, and right away they'd give the baby, whichever one, to Debbie, and she'd begin to nurse that baby, and I can see right now in my mind, I can see Debbie's face as she's just gazing upon the face of her newborn baby while she's nursing it. Wow. It's the most intimate time. It's the most adoring time. It's the time when there's just this, this connection, this intimacy, this endearment. And that mom first delivers her baby and she's nursing that baby and just gazing in this brand new little gift space. And, and uh, what a wonderful time it is. Uh, and so we have the Apostle Paul as he's talking about his own self as a missionary, a pastor, opening up his heart and he said, I have been gentle with you. And, and he said, even as a, even as a mother is, is in nursing her children. And that's what the, the pastor's heart has to be that way. 
There are situations. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it gives us an exhortation there. Um, it's, there's a degree of negativity about it, but I think we also can see a positive thing about it. But it says, you know, a point in time, you should not be drinking of the milk of the Word of God any longer, but the meat. But there are a lot of times when the pastor has to give the milk out to the brand new little babies. They may be 70 years old. Doesn't mean they're a baby. They're, they're elderly. They're, they are, you know, they're smart and all of that sort of thing. But in the things of God, they just got saved. By the way, take a time out here. Please pray for Dottie. I surely miss her, don't you? And they got saved when she's 65 now, of course. She's in her 80s, but fell here a month or so ago. And she's in a cast, broke her wrist there in three places. And, you know, she's always in church, right? Donna, always right there. And we surely miss her. Please pray for her. But I think about her, 65 years of age, she got saved. Think of that. So I say in relation to nursing, it doesn't matter what the age group may be. But someone that has not been saved long, they have to be nursed and nurtured. We think of that word nurtured. A baby's not just nursed, but the affection of a pastor understands that likewise, that brand new person has to be nurtured. They have to be not just given some milk, but little by little by little, they have to be nurtured. They have to be burnt sometimes. What? We have to be burnt? Oh, believe me, I have burnt many a Christian. By the way, that's not one of my fun things of life. Because they've got something caught in their throat or whatever, and, uh, you know, somebody griped at them about something and, and discouraged them about something. So you have to go burp them a little bit, you know, pat them on the back, get them to burp a little, and then their digestive system gets a whole lot better. I'm talking symbolic. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But that's what the pastor's heart does. It, it, it's affectionate toward these brand new people. And there's the nursing and the nurturing. Let me take notice here in verse number 8. So being affectionately uh, desirous of you, we are willing to have imparted unto you. And, and we notice secondly here the attention. And we see this all through all the letters. My, oh my, the Apostle Paul, he writes things like, I thank God for every, every remembrance of you. He's constantly speaking these words, which, which allows the people in any town, whether it's Thessalonica, Galatia, Ephesus, Corinth, where it may be, Philippi, all these letters we have in the Bible, and certainly many others, but he's constantly reminding them how that they have his attention. That is so vital. That they've got his attention. I've stated this in sermons about child rearing. I'm probably now, by the way, Sunday mornings now in Sunday school, and the adults were getting going in some areas about the family and child rearing. I'll be covering some things in Sunday school over the next number of weeks. You know, Brother James, he did great last week on that saxophone, didn't he? Don't you think? Played that solo down here, and I thought he just did wonderful. I enjoyed it so much. And even this morning, Played there with the orchestra, but he really, we had him, of course, was important. We had his mother giving him piano lessons for a lot of years. He didn't really enjoy that, <laughs> right? And there were many a time when he and his mom were crossed up because of it, because he hated it. But you know, he really had to learn the piano, get to know the notes, timing, so he could play the saxophone and lead the singing even, and sing to the choir and do all these things. I knew because I was in the same boat. My mother gave me piano lessons for eight years. And <laughs> I didn't mention this morning I could play Sunrise, Sunset. I could play a few songs. I could play a Calvary by memory. I got to do some things. But, but mostly I can't play the piano. I haven't touched it now for a long time. So I knew how he felt. So, of course, he's being forced to practice his piano lesson every day. And so I knew he didn't enjoy it, but I came in from the office and walked in the dining room over there at the parsonage, and he'd be practicing his piano, and maybe I'd walk by him, wouldn't say a word, but I'd just go like that on his shoulder as he was practicing. Just to let him know, I understand. You've got my attention. 
Just keep trying to plug away at it. It's okay. Let him know in all my children different ways. Let them know that they had my attention now. And it's vital, by the way, parents, that your children always know that you're always on their mind. Same way with the church. It's the exact same thing. And the Apostle Paul says here about being willing. That's a great word. He was willing. He was willing to do whatever, whatever it took. Teaching, yes, but many other things as well. And the church, the people at Thessalonica, they had his attention. Sharing his time. He's willing to share his time with them. And uh, to do all he can to just befriend them. And, and to enjoy that brother-sister atmosphere. One with another in the church. And, and, and that's the way the pastor's heart is. You go around and you hear the stories of everybody's life. And sometimes you can't ever repeat the stories. Sometimes... Sometimes there are situations where people think somebody should be a deacon or they should be a, they should be a trustee or be a Sunday school teacher. And sometimes the pastor knows some information from some point there back there that nobody else knows. And so you have to kind of just trust the pastor that eh, those issues back there that just don't cater to being in that position, not even biblically doesn't allow us to put you in that position. And so you learn the stories, hear all the stories, and you listen to the stories. And... Uh, that's why, Scott, that's why I remember birthdays and graduation years and I listen to your stories and it's important to me and I don't forget them. <coughs> Wendy there just had a birthday this past Monday on Valentine's Day, right? And a lot of the rest of you don't. I call your birthdays off just by memory. Um, and And Graduation, why is that? It's not because I'm super smart. It's all because you have my attention. You have my heart. It's, I'm interested in what's going on in your life. That's the way the Apostle Paul was. He shared time, he listened to stories, and, and of course shared time of trials as well. No oh my. I don't even know I can even go through parts of this because I've sat, I've stood and held people's hands in their dying moments. Been with the family. As I mentioned earlier, I have felt the warm tears going down my neck and a spouse saying, how could I ever live without them? They were my rock. They, they were everything in my life. I, I, I can't even imagine. How can I keep going, Pastor? I can't keep going. And I can feel their tears just pouring down my face. It's heart wrenching. You're willing to do that because the Lord God calls you to do that, but you also are willing to do that because of your affections and your love for people. And, and uh, middle of the night, I, I always have to chuckle on this day, this very day. 31 years ago, this day, he became pastor, Emmanuel Baptist Church. But I remember so vividly, um, I'm over in the parsonage, just moved in the parsonage as I became the pastor. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning and my phone rings. And I thought to myself, okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm pastor now. And it was Mrs. Hare. She's in heaven now, but many of you remember. I always sat right around here in Belt Donna City. And uh, always there in her place. But it was Mrs. Hare, and there was a medical issue. And, and uh, okay, here we go. I'm Pastor Nelly. They're not calling my. No, I don't like to be in my flesh saying, well, call my dad. <laughs> but uh oh, I'm Pastor now. And truly, Brother James, we both, we've sat there with her through many a trial and, and her family and many others. and Because that's what the pastor's heart demands. I honestly, I feel so sorry for people of big mainline denominations where the pastor doesn't know the people and the people don't hardly know the pastor other than standing in front and speaking to the sermon. For me, it's all about the people, servicing the people, being there, at whatever hour of the day it may be. And uh, 
909. I remember one night, Ramona, I remember one night, I remember a couple times in your life, your family's lives, but I remember one night your brother was running a motorcycle down Silverdale Drive, 90 miles an hour, and he lost control of his motorcycle, literally at 90 miles an hour. And he's going down Silverdale Drive over there, lost control, and so his body is skidding on the asphalt, right? It was pretty nasty. So it's four o'clock in the morning, and I get a phone call from the hospital, Mertz room, and said such and such is here, and, and uh, he really wants his pastor to come here and be with him. And so, what do you do? Four o'clock in the morning, you get dressed. I do not understand how pastors can live with themselves and do anything else than that type of thing. I'm not trying to brag on myself. I'm just trying to reveal what goes on in the pastor's heart. I couldn't possibly ignore that. I mean, my heart would not allow me to ignore that. I knew her brother when he was with that, I don't know, 15, 16, I don't know. I mean, I knew her when she was yet a teenager. And, and so I was almost a teenager, right? But, but I mean, we go back there a long way. I would possibly not get out of bed and get right to the hospital. You know, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just trying to be transparent the way I believe that God wants all under shepherds, all pastors. I just think that's what God wants us to think. Pastor's heart. But, you know, thirdly, we've talked about the pastor's affections, his attention, willing, being able to willingly do whatever. But then, and truly, you may think this is an odd one, but the adoration I have for our people, even a crowd that be here on a Sunday night. The modern day tendencies are, people aren't gonna come anyway, so let's just close it down. Dear friends, me and you, we need all of the friendship, fellowship, and the worship of the living Christ we can get a hold of. And people say churches, in my opinion, they, they simply are making excuses. But, well, everybody's had family night. Well, what's your all family night on Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night? I mean, you got seven days a week, and, and you think family night ought to be on a Sunday night? That's baloney. It's church night. As long as I'm pastor, we're always going to have church on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. It's important that we meet together, but... And so I just adore and admire those that put forth the effort to be in all the services. And I tell people, I tell my preacher friends, and I say things, but then again, sometimes because of my expectations and people that I adore so much and admire so much and love so much, boy, they crush my heart sometimes. I get really disappointed. We both do, do we not? I mean, there's a lot of Sunday mornings and Sunday nights we go home and, and we have discussions about it and I bounce off of her and she bounces off of me, but I'm so thankful for a spectacular wife that allows me to be able to talk to her and, and to be able to unload, if you will. Sometimes she has to take the blunt of, your, of me fussing at you. Aren't you glad she does that? <laughs> Sometimes I'm ticked off, you know, we get ticked off, right? And I don't tell you off, but I tell her off for you. You know what I mean like that? I feel bad I do that, but she's been marvelous listening, and, and we both are disappointed a lot of times in people, and they walk out with not faithful and not loyal and get backslidden. Again, there's no greater crushing blow to the pastor than for people to get backslidden and quit. They're not quitting on the pastor. They're not quitting on the church. They're quitting on Jesus Christ, my Savior, our Savior. And that crushes my heart for his sake. That crushes my heart. The one that died for us, and then people would walk out on him. How can that be? Oh, it crushes my heart. I can only imagine how it crushes him. But then again, there are many, many delights that come along with being a pastor, and so I don't want to leave that on a negative side. The Apostle Paul had Lydia, and many others that were in his life that he had led to Christ, and wow, they grew in the Lord, and they were strong in the Lord, and faithful in the, with the Lord, and, and the 
delight. Oh, how I just delighted in so many people. Young Timothy, I trained him, and what a great man of God he was. And I've enjoyed so much. A few years ago, I got thinking about how many young people have come through Emmanuel Baptist Church and went out into full-time Christian work. I began to count them. This is back six, eight years ago, I guess now. I began to count them. I couldn't believe it. I got up to 32. Some are older, the Barrett's Tyler's. Some are older now. I counted 32 people that were walk, walk, were part of this church, sang in the choir, did all these things that were in full-time Christian. Let me tell you, dear friend, they may not mean much to you, but not many churches can say that. And even tonight, we don't have as many tonight. Some have dropped by the wayside, unfortunately, and that's disappointing. But of course, I think of the ones, even the Barretts again, the Tyler's down there in Brazil. And how, how do you even, how do you even talk about, how do you even place value upon the second generation? Jeremy, we support him, Tyler, of course, Gary and Pam, and now there's that second generation, but Likewise, I think of like Ty Thomas, you know, grew up right here, went through the system of Emmanuel Baptist Church, and, and Andy Umstead, there he is working down there for Crown College, and Sarah Walker teaching school, and my own children, and <laughs> my siblings, some of them, and there's been a lot of young people. Wow, that's the delight of every pastor. But besides that, not just ones in full time Christian work, but any or all young people that came here as elementary children and, and teenagers and, and they grew in the Lord and they may have moved away to whatever town, but they got in there, they're deacons and they're serving the Lord someplace. And though they may be paid at a different place, their occupation's different than full-time, but they're still serving the Lord, just like just like they're in full-time Christian work. We got who knows how many are out there like that. Now that's the delights of a pastor's heart. That's what I believe a church should be all about. That's what I believe a pastor should be all about. And I believe when you're gentle and nourishing, nourishing them and nursing them and their parents and their children, that is the result of it all. Many disappoint, many disappoint. Oh, I get disappointed. Hey, so did the Apostle Paul. Remember John Mark? He had one that disappointed him, right? Quit on him. Quit on the Lord. He was crushed by that one. You have those? Oh, I praise God for the ones that have come through Emmanuel. Now they're out there somewhere in church tonight. And God has been good to us here as a church. has been good to me. And uh, so that's the pastor's heart. Now, if you want to stay another hour, I'll tell you many stories and the rest of the story, but I don't think you'll do that. Everybody's hungry, right? Let's stand, please. Oh, Father, I cannot praise you enough for these dear people that I love as if they're my very own flesh and blood. I'm so grateful that you allowed me to be here all these years. To be able to share time, yes, and even trials and temptations and tribulations. And you stood by the deathbed of so many people and conducted funerals and held on to people while they're crying and crying and their bodies are shaking as they're sobbing and young people and old people alike. And that crushes my heart. Oh, God. I thank you that I can be a part of that, though, and be stand for you, stand in the presence of your behalf. I pray you help us all to love each other, to encourage one another, to love Jesus most of all. May we be what you want us to be. We love you. I pray that your blessings be upon us. Even the invitation now, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take a moment, right in front of the coming altar, like you do so.